In this video, I'll be taking on my largest project ever, pouring a whole lot of epoxy resin, making a pretty wild table base. And of course, you can't have a big project without some big mistakes. So as I said in the intro, this is the biggest project I've ever taken on. And one of the main challenges with building big things, especially as a one-man shop, is moving large heavy things around. I would have cut this from the video, but I think it's kind of funny to watch me struggle, so I left it in and you'll be seeing some more later. But anyways, when people usually mention big projects, no matter the craft, the size is usually associated with ideas of grandeur, skill, and craftsmanship. And while there are some factors that make a larger project more difficult, such as moving it around, at its core, the same fundamental skills are applied no matter the size of the project. For the most part, everything is equally as challenging, it just takes longer. That being said, for some reason this project was still really daunting to me. I think it had to do with the fact that my brain can't picture the entire project process at once. Even having finished it now and doing the voiceover, it's hard for me to imagine all of the steps that went into it in series, and I designed and built it so I know better than anyone what went into it. The fact that my brain couldn't picture it all at once though, made the scope of the project seem way bigger. This is where I found the importance of breaking down everything into steps. See. Today, I was just going to cut the melamine into an epoxy form, and I can do that. Besides manhandling the 4x8 sheets on the workbench, that's a walk in the park. Cut the sides, caulk the seams, screw it all together, and bam, melamine form finished. Now having explained to you why building larger projects really isn't as hard as you might assume, for the sake of this video, could you just forget about that for a sec? I think the contrast between how I live my day-to-day -day life and my woodworking is kind of funny because of how stark it is. When I have a project, I've planned everything out in a mental game plan. On the other hand, on a day-to-day -day basis, I just kind of exist. I have a general idea of what needs to be done and where I need to be, but other than that, I just show up and do something and it kind of works out well enough. And the reason I have such a well thought out plan is probably because I'm thinking about woodworking anytime my mind wanders. But I've actually had a shift in my thought process recently though, and that's due to the fact that now I film my projects for videos. And when I daydream about how to make a project, I'm also imagining how to make it into a comprehensive and entertaining video. Which is partially why I've decided to make a resin river table. I hear those do quite well on YouTube, so I hope you'll indulge me as I take you through the process of how I made this slab top. You might be a little confused as to what I've been doing. And that's fine, I haven't been doing much explaining, but I'm going to try and clear things up here. I've been prepping for an epoxy pour, so I've cleaned up the slab and filled in some cracks, and then sealed the slabs with one coat of epoxy. Now the way I'm making this river is something I've never seen anyone do before. Not saying it's never been done before, but I've never seen it and so I don't think you have either. A normal river table has two sides, and you just pour a solid epoxy down the middle. But I'm doing things a little differently. After sealing the slab, I'm going to do a first layer, about half an inch thick on the bottom. Then I'm going to add the MDF piece you've been watching me cut on top, and embed that in a second pour. This isn't a new technique though, it just helps me save money on resin, because this stuff is expensive. I then use a tabletop epoxy to hand make an art piece on the top of the table. So instead of just a solid color, it'll be specially crafted art. This project took me a really long time to make. Of course, some of that came down to size, like I've said before, but to be honest, so much of the time it's taken me to finish has just been spent waiting around, and most of that time waiting was waiting for epoxy to cure. I think if I total up the net time I spent waiting for epoxy to cure, it comes in at probably over a week. This didn't really feel like a break though, since if you've ever worked with epoxy yourself, or seen people do so, you know how bad things can go catastrophically wrong. A pour can look perfect when you do it and leave the shop, and then the next day it could have all leaked onto the floor, gluing everything it touches to the ground, wasting hundreds of dollars, and possibly ruining the entire project. On the second pour, I ran into my first hurdle, which like most mishaps, was due entirely to my own idiocy. 
I was supposed to fill this knot hole with epoxy, but it had slipped my mind and I had already poured my entire supply of deep pour into the river. Luckily for me, I'm lazy when it comes to things like this and I didn't get everything out of the bottles the first time around, so I was able to scrounge up just enough to fill it. Having done so, I felt like my obligatory mistake had been overcome, and I was free to rest easy until I realized... Basically, the MDF core had begun to float up out of the pour, which is really bad. With some quick thinking, I decided to tape up some blocks and use some calls to clamp the MDF down. I saw the boards push out a bunch of air bubbles, which was a good sign, but this fix led to some different problems down the line. But for the time being, I was blissfully unaware. I filled the block voids, then stressfully waited until it was fully cured, and prepped it for the big pour. At this point, my nerves were really starting to get to me, but I'll let past me take it away from here. All right, so I just finished setting up everything for the big, the big final pour. It's uh, it's actually not technically more volume than the previous pours I've done, but this time the final one's gonna be done with tabletop epoxy, which is a much shorter pot life than the deep pour epoxy I've been using. So basically, if I take too long it'll fry itself in a bucket and I will be totally screwed. I guess nothing to it but to do it. And do it I did indeed. Now, I have done epoxy art before, four years ago back when I was a freshman in high school, so I did have some experience under my belt. However, for starters, those pores were about 20 times smaller than what I am attempting now, and thinking back on it now, only one of the three I did even looked good at all, so I don't know where this false confidence I had came from, but I thought that I could do it well enough with my very complete set of tools consisting of my hairdryer and popsicle sticks. Spoiler alert, it did not go well. What was that thing I said again? Right, right, that was it. So, even though I did identify the main possible challenge I would face, I still managed to mess it up anyways, and before I knew it, the epoxy had kicked and it was coming out in gross clumps. It was just a huge messy disaster, and I tried my best to save it, but it was just too little, too late. So, I did the first epoxy pour a couple days ago, and it's pretty safe to say that it went terribly. And I tried to salvage it afterwards, but as I looked at it, it just wasn't up to standard with what I feel comfortable putting out as my work. After mulling it over, I decided I'm gonna purchase one more gallon of epoxy and try it one more time. The table literally only has space for one more epoxy pour, so if I mess this up, it's over. I can't do it again. So yeah, if I screw this up, that's it. It's pretty safe to say that if I was nervous about the last pour, I am now about as panicked as can be. I'm usually a pretty calm and collected guy, but the fact that over a grand of materials and weeks of work is on the line here is enough to get my heart pumping. In my desperation to figure out a way to not screw up again, I decided to take a gamble on an idea I had. These syringes. The idea was that I could precisely place the gold epoxy exactly where I wanted instead of trying to pour it in, because even if I try to be as delicate as possible, it's still really hard to perfectly place it. The gold is really the most critical color as it really pops out from the cooler tones. All that being said, trying a new technique at arguably the most critical point of a project is probably not the wisest thing to do, but at the same time, it was the only idea I really had, so I went for it, and thank god I did because this pour came out amazingly. After all that stress, I was definitely due for some things just working out in my favor, but the next step in the project was demolding the table from the form, which can notoriously be a real headache of a step in these epoxy projects. And of course, given my luck, when I tried whacking the sides of the hammer, nothing happened, so I had to bust out the chisel and pry the sides of the mold off. Things are really not looking good, I mean, if I have to put this much effort into just getting the sides off, 
then the bottom is going to be a nightmare and has so much more surface area to bond to it. Oh, it just popped right off. I guess I was due for some things just working out in my favor. Well, while I make this flattening jig, I might as well tell you about my design process for this project. For some context, I'm about to go into my second year as a design student in college, so I threw together these initial designs utilizing what I had learned in the past year, but when I showed them to my mom who I'm building this table for, she didn't really seem all that interested in any of the mockups. I then brought out this model of a table I designed years ago, and she absolutely loved it. But in my head, I was just thinking, if I've spent a year of my life going to school for something only to have come out worse, what's the point? But the more I looked at the design, the more I noticed a bunch of things that could be improved, and decided to put my nose to the grindstone, ideate for a few hours, and eventually landed on this design. It takes obvious inspiration from the original, but has slight changes throughout, changes that I wouldn't have made a year or two earlier, but made a huge difference in the overall piece. Taking feedback treads a fine line. On one hand, sometimes it's important to take pretty much everything to heart, in something like client work. On the other hand, it's almost a universal truth that not everyone will like everything you do, so then some opinions are just less valuable in context. But both these mindsets are useful and true in their own respects, but can also be harmful in their extremes. Somewhere in between is a fine line to take criticism well. Speaking of fine lines, here I am trying to find the fine line where my router perfectly flattens the tabletop to be level with the epoxy pour. I'm going back and forth to each corner, taking shallow passes and adding shims underneath accordingly until the router will cut everything evenly across the entire tabletop. This was another technique that I'd never seen before, but tried anyways, partially because I didn't have any other options. I will say, in order for this to work, the table can't warp during the pour, or else the technique falls apart, which is why most people just surface about an eighth of an inch over the entire top. But because I had made artwork as the final layer, if I flattened it the standard way, it would simply remove the entire art piece. I flattened the top until there was a slight lip left protruding, then moved on to rough sanding with 80 grit. This would allow me to remove all of the tear out and router marks without making the wood section slightly lower than the epoxy. You can really see the difference here, where the near side is rough and the other side is sanded. Then a few 120 grit passes fully homogenizes everything. It was finally time to start shaping the top. Here I'm marking out a center line to align my template to, which is half the size of the entire top. Actually, it's a little hard to visualize, so hopefully this animation makes it easier to understand the subtle curve and shape of the top. This was the first of many relatively small details of the piece that made the process of making it exponentially more difficult and time consuming. If you can remember my original design, the table was far more rectangular. A vast majority of the pieces had 90 degree angles, meaning I could easily cut them with a table saw or circular saw, and I'd just be done with them. And so I'd probably approximate that it would have been at least 8 times faster to shape the pieces in the old design. But even though it would have been so much faster, easier, and less error prone to make all the pieces straight, something simply won't allow me to sacrifice a design for my own comfort. I think this is a common feeling that festers and grows within artists and makers as we grow and develop, and I honestly don't know what compels us to do this, but until I figure it out, I guess I'll just keep making a mess doing things the hard way. Earlier in the video, I mentioned that my quick fix during the second epoxy pour would have consequences down the line, and now here we are. In my rush, I put one call in the center and one in the middle, since only one end was floating up. However, this pushed the opposite side up and caused the bubbles from the middle to creep over to the other side, creating air pockets, which I now had to fill. So I took out the multi-tool and a sanding drum to cut out the thin parts and poured more epoxy into these voids. 
Then I scraped off the Haku Dam I made around the pour and sanded everything flat. And unless you were really staring up at the bottom of this table, you would never even know that there had been a mistake. Next, I had to route in four grooves along the bottom of the table. And it's safe to say that after all that had gone into the top so far, I was pretty nervous to cut into it. But after checking the cut depth on the router what must have been at least 10 times, I had to just do it. You may be wondering why I'm even doing this at all, and it's to embed steel C-channel flush into the table. The main purpose of the C-channel is to keep the table from bowing or twisting along its width over time, essentially just keeping it flat throughout the seasons of the year and varying air moisture levels. But I also need it for something I've never seen done before, which I'll show later in this video. This is only my second real YouTube video, so I'm still figuring out how to make something both entertaining and comprehensive. And to be honest, I'm struggling with it quite a lot. For example, I'm about to sand the inside corners of the slots round so the C-channel can sit flush. Is this necessary to show though? It took me like an hour to do so and my hand was cramping the entire time. And if I hadn't done this, it would have been really bad. But if I don't show these steps, would anybody even notice? Or more importantly, if no one would notice, would the video be better? On the other hand, I'm about to be installing some threaded inserts, which I think is a kind of best of both worlds part of a video. It's necessary to show as part of the process, and it's also pretty satisfying to watch for the layman viewer. At least that's what I think. I could be entirely wrong about all of this. One thing I do know for sure though is that nobody wants to watch the tedious stuff, like me filling in every single crack with CA glue. One crack is pretty satisfying, but 50 of them is quite the opposite. The other thing I know for sure is that no one likes sanding, least of all this guy. I mean, look at this guy. He is so done with sanding. With sanding over though, I can move on to what people would argue is the most satisfying part of woodworking, finishing. And editing this back, I can see why. From an outside perspective, watching the table transform entirely in a matter of seconds really does scratch that itch in the back of our heads. But for me personally, finishing is probably the part of woodworking that I dread the most. And that's because in the span of an hour or so, it's possible to ruin a project and there isn't really going back, besides of course re-sanding everything and doing it all over again. There is an upside though, and that is that the finish I'm using now has taken a lot of the stress out of the finishing recently. I'm using Rubio Monaco, a two-part hard wax oil that can be applied, like the name suggests, in just one coat, and it's pretty simple to get right to. With the top done, it was time to move on to the base. The workflow I've chosen for this project relies heavily on MDF templates, which I'm showing how to make here. Since I don't have access to a CNC in my garage shop, I made all of these by hand, just using printed templates, a jigsaw, a belt sander, and also a table saw to make all the parallel joint faces. Now, every single one of these has a unique shape, which is somewhat counterintuitive to how people usually use the template method since templates really shine when used to make many copies of the same part, since MDF is cheap and one template can be used over and over and over. But I've made a bunch of single-use ones instead. However, in my opinion, it's still worth it to do it this way, since the time it takes to shape a quarter-inch thick MDF template and use several passes on the router to copy it onto the final wood is still way less than shaping the entirety of every final part by hand. Also. If I mess up making an MDF template, it really isn't a big deal since I can just make another one, but if I mess up shaping the final part, it's much worse. Here you can see for yourself just how streamlined the process becomes using templates. First I align the template to the top and bottom edges, which I just squared up, and stick it on with double sided tape. I then use a black marker to trace out the shape, which just makes the next step, cutting the outline on the bandsaw, easier to do, since I have a clear line to follow. 
I can then bring it over to the router table and copy the shape with the templating bit, running it through a few times, taking shallow passes. Pop the template off, and flush trim the rest of the material off to reveal a perfect part. Next, I'll be making these parts of the base, which I will also be using the template method to do. It's gonna look like I'm doing something else here, but the basic theory behind everything is exactly the same. I'm setting up a simple sled to cut the angles onto the joint faces. This is the same as what I did before, only on the other parts, the angles were 90 degrees, so I didn't need a sled. And on these parts, the only difference is that I have to glue up the pieces into 3 inch thick stock first, then establish a flat face to run against the fence of the sled. But after that, it's the same deal. Cut the joint faces, then realize that the saw blade can't cut all the way through, so finish up the cut with some good old hand sawing and flush trim the end. These parts are actually quite cool in that because of the angles, there is a point at which everything just lines up as long as I cut in the general ballpark, so I didn't actually measure for any of those cuts. But after that, it's the exact same process as before. Tape on the templates, bandsaw, and then route everything flush. Here, I'm just showing the thicker pieces since I think it's way more satisfying. And like I've been saying, it's the same process either way. This is the first part of the video that I think might be kind of confusing, but I'll try my best to explain it. Well, you saw that I taped on a paper template to the parts, and now I'm clamping on a piece of MDF with the little slot cut out of it, and aligning it to these rectangles which show me where to cut. Then with the help of a bushing in my router and a half inch bit, I can cut a perfect mortise into the part. For the corresponding parts, it's pretty similar, but the mortises go into the end grain. So I cut out some templates and tape them on, and then clamp this simple jig to the piece while holding it upright, and cut in this corresponding mortise for the floating tenon joint. No one will ever know that they're in here, but it makes a huge difference in the strength of the base. Speaking of things people might not ever notice, this edge detail is probably one of them. Here you can see the profile difference before and after adding this thumbnail detail to the edges. From that perspective, it's really apparent, but when the base is all assembled and done, it's not something anyone would probably ever comment on. Yet despite this fact, the details no one pays attention to are sometimes the most important in making a piece feel finished, cohesive, and professional. When someone sees the table, of course they're going to comment on the epoxy top, or the eccentric and over the top base, but the feel of a piece isn't something anybody notices, but more something they absorb when taking a step back, and sometimes it has a bigger effect on whether they like a piece than the things that are super front and center. So if I were to give one tip in this video, it would be to spend just as much time on the details as the center pieces. It really counts more than you would think. Earlier, when I was bandsawing out the 3 inch parts, I neglected to tell you something because it would have ruined the satisfaction of the moment, but I have to come clean. I was pushing my crappy old little bandsaw way too hard with 3 inch stock, and even though I was always outside my line, the blade drifted down at the bottom of some of my cuts, leaving some gouges, which I'm now having to fill with sawdust and glue. The few pieces that have these defects I'm choosing to place at the top of the base, so unless somebody crawls under the table and looks really closely, nobody will ever notice. Closing in on final glue up, there were a couple more things to do. Firstly, some chamfered edge details for cohesion's sake, then hand sanding the thumbnail edges and taking an orbital sander to the rest of the parts. The last thing to do before final glue up was to make the floating tenons which was really simple. Just cut some rectangles, round over the corners with a quarter inch router bit, then set up a stop block to cut them all to length. Then it was time for final glue up. At this point, the project had me thinking back on everything I did, especially the little things. Like here, when I labeled each piece with a number and a direction so I wouldn't make any mistakes with similar looking parts and these tiny little details stuck out to me for some reason. I think it's because this was the first project where I took the time and patience to do every little thing properly. When I was younger, I always wanted to see progress as quickly as possible, which usually meant doing things in an order that would see results the quickest, but not lead to the best end result. 
As a simple example, I used to always rush to glue up, usually putting off sanding until the end. Then when it came time to sand, I ended up skipping inside corners and hard to reach spots because I wanted to apply finish and see the project all shiny and done. But inevitably, that would lead to imperfections due to my impatience. I've also noticed that I've become far more confident in my ideas. Earlier in the video, I said that the C channel would be used for more than just its usual function, and here is that secondary use. I'm going to be attaching the base to the top through the C channel because the base design is an unorthodox shape, using a few more threaded inserts. This isn't something I'd ever seen before, but I was willing to put faith in my own plan. Not only using it on the table, but also putting this out onto the internet for everyone to see and judge. I mean, for all I know, there could be a very good reason that I've never seen this done before, and I've made a huge oversight somehow mounting the top this way. But nonetheless, I've chosen to have faith in my ideas and put them out into the world, accepting the possibility that I may be wrong, but doing it anyways. Things are ever changing in life. Every few years, I move to a new house, graduate to a new school, but the one constant I have in my life is woodworking. Ever since I got my first power tool when I was 11, I've been able to see my progress, my maturity and growth through the strange and unique lens of my craftsmanship and the mindset behind that craftsmanship. All the little things that I've skipped and the mistakes I've made and now, all the details I've focused on, and how I've learned to overcome challenges. So, I know I've been a legal adult for a few years now, but looking at this project, I think I can finally say that I've grown up. If you've made it to the end of the video, I want to give you a huge thank you. Really, it means a lot. And since you've made it this far, why not subscribe? it would be a huge motivation for me to keep making more videos. Again, thank you so much, and I'll catch you in the next one.